Uh, very excited to be here today. Uh, I'm, I'm actually a longtime fan of WSO2 and an early advisor. Uh, you know, always pleasure to speak with folks like Paul Fremantle. And, you know, I, I'm excited about extending a little bit of the metaphor of biological systems. Uh, today, uh, I will be talking a little bit about sort of futures, and one of the areas in which I'm focused is actually blockchain technology. So, you know, I know it's pretty edgy. I, I, you know, I, I imagine there's a number of folks in the audience who are already rolling their eyes because, you know, it's sort of not another enterprise blockchain talk. So it's definitely, uh, you know, a choppy water, so it's, it's not an easy place to talk from. So I'll, I'll do my best. So uh, I invest out of a fund called Gumi Cryptos. It's a 30 million US dollar fund focused on early stage opportunities. Uh, created by blockchain technologies. I'll define a little bit about what that means in a moment. Uh, but I'm also working on a mobile wallet and exchange product called Evercoin, which is a lot less relevant to today's uh, conference. And of course, I've been a sort of a longtime friend of WSO2. So what I'd like to really talk about is this blockchain technology in the context of the API economy. So, you know, I think you all have had really great background in this over the past couple of talks. So, you know, to me, I don't really need to say much about the API economy. Obviously, we saw an even better and more impressive chart from Paul describing what Uber looks like, you know, and really, this is really the difference between what Walmart looked like. And this is actually an old slide. So this is what Walmart looked like in 2015. They've probably improved a lot. But I think what's really important to understand is, is that, you know, participating in the API economy becomes existential, which is that, you know, you're either participating and benefiting from the API economy or you're uh, in trouble, right? And I think the thing that, the same thing can be said of all essentially open source technologies, which is that you're either participating in the open source economy or, of course, you're in trouble. I think one of the things that's amazing about WSO2 is it reflects an organization that's at the perfect confluence of these two forces, which is open source and, of course, the API economy. So I want to reason about what happens next in open source and the API economy. So, uh, you know, this slide should be familiar to Asanka. It's actually from his white paper, but it really talks about a financial services reference model and architecture that WSO2 participates in. So to me, the place that I think is of most note with respect to blockchain applications is actually in the payment domain. So really the transfer of value. So I'm really going to talk really much more about this type of uh, event because I think it's extremely significant to the emergence of the API economy. So just a little bit of background on this whole blockchain phenomenon. So in October 31st of 2008, about one month after the collapse of Lehman Brothers, a funny little white paper suddenly appeared on the internet under the pseudonym of Satoshi Nakamoto. And this is, of course, the Bitcoin white paper. So, you know, there's no real way. I know in the enterprise it's fashionable to talk about blockchain without Bitcoin. But I think it's actually a mistake. And it's a mistake to talk about blockchain without Bitcoin, both for historical reasons, but also for logical and semantic reasons. And the thing that I think is important to understand is exactly what has occurred. So what has occurred is actually fundamental to not just the API economy, but also to open source, which is that we actually have seen a shift and a creation of a new form of open source project. And it's an open source project wherein there is now a protocol whereby the internet is printing its own money. So this particular chart here actually has this concept of BTC uh, or Bitcoin as being a money transfer protocol. So that's a very interesting mindset and it's something that I think is important to understand in the context of the internet protocols. So. Uh, my friend Joel Monegro, uh, uh, who's also a venture capitalist, wrote a, a really seminal piece for the blockchain industry called Fat Protocols. So the idea of a fat protocol is really the notion that you now have the ability to transfer value and scarcity. 
So this is really, I think, the fundamental innovation of what's happening in the blockchain, because those of you who are familiar with distributed databases and distributed computing can actually observe what the blockchain is. So if you actually study, for example, the Bitcoin blockchain, what you're going to observe is you're going to observe that it's essentially, um, if you look at Brewer's cap theorem, it's basically an AP style database, right? So it's a NoSQL database that essentially stores transactions. And really what we should emphasize is the database replication protocol, right? So, you know, it's really a NoSQL database of the type that is eventually consistent, right? So this is fine, right? But I think the fact that architecturally it does a database function really produces a lot of logical error in finding applications. And so the reason why I think it's important that you know, I not kind of fall into the great mass of not another enterprise blockchain talk, is that I think one of the fundamental flaws in the reasoning around enterprise blockchain is that since blockchain is dependent on a novel form of database replication protocol, that in fact it should be used as a database. So what I'm going to assert is I'm going to assert that using blockchains as databases is actually a terrible idea. And it's a terrible idea since because it's, it's really slow. It's a slow electricity burning database. It's like the worst possible database. And so the question then becomes, well, what is, what is it then good for? Right? So what we have to do then is we have to peel all the way back to the so-called Bitcoin white paper by Satoshi Nakamoto. So this is a picture of Satoshi. Uh, it's actually not the real Satoshi. Uh, it's this guy is actually, his name is Dorian Satoshi Nakamoto, and he, he became kind of the face of Bitcoin. Uh, and I think it was Newsweek or some popular magazine actually printed an article suspecting that he was really Satoshi Nakamoto based only on the fact that his actual name is Satoshi Nakamoto and based on almost nothing else. Uh, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> he had a very interesting life for about two weeks and then uh, people figured out that that was not a thing. Um, but he's sort of the face of this. But the reason why I'm putting his face on the screen here is uh, what I wanted to speak about is really like what was solved by the Bitcoin white paper. So, you know, if we reason about the fundamental value of blockchain technology, what we need to understand is we need to understand that what was solved is essentially a variation of something that's called the Byzantine general's problem, which is the notion of an untrusted intermediary. So how do you transport something across the field of an untrusted set of intermediaries. And it turns out that the way that you do this is through this kind of notion of a Byzantine fault tolerant uh, sort of intermediary fabric. And that's really what the Bitcoin replication protocol provides, right? But one thing that I think that you should note that's a shift in open source and open source principles is one of the fundamental shifts that arrived as a function of Bitcoin is the concept of what I think of as an open source decentralized ops. So what's really interesting is in the history of open source, there's only been open source development. And the reason why is that servers cost money, right? So in order to run a server, it costs money. But the thing that's amazing about the Bitcoin blockchain is the Bitcoin blockchain actually prints money. So since it prints money, you can actually have these things called miners. And what a miner does is it downloads a node off of the GitHub or SourceForge and it starts executing it. And it's being compensated by the blockchain itself for running a node. So at that point now, you have an open and open source ops team, which means that the ops team is like whoever wants to run a node. And the thing that's beautiful about this arrangement is, is that the protocol takes care of bad actors. Right, so if you run a fake node and you start lying to the blockchain and sending false messages, um, it's very easy and it's very thermodynamically expensive to lie to the blockchain about blockchain events. But to me, I think there's a bunch of logical errors that flow from the idea of enterprise blockchain. And I think one of the biggest flaws is the idea of when is this useful? So to me, the central premise of there being an enterprise is the idea that you have an entity that can be trusted, right? So if you have a, if you have a counterparty that can be trusted, then you really don't need 
these complicated trust mechanics. You just need, so I have this thing, right? So if you look at the structure of what people call performance uh, on, on blockchain, people talk about high performance blockchains. The thing that's really interesting is, is if you look at the Bitcoin blockchain, the Bitcoin blockchain has seven transactions per second. It's exceedingly bad and slow. And the reason why is that there's a slider of trust where you trust zero parties. If you move the trust slider to be, being able to trust one party, if you can just trust one party, you now have what I call the Oracle blockchain or you have the Postgres blockchain. You know, you have this thing that's exceedingly fast, right? And it, then you, you've solved your, your problem. So, so the use of this as a, as a database is a bad use. So the question then is like, what is a good use? And like, how should we reason about what good uses should look like in this context? So what I wanted to do is just kind of play a bit of a video for you. And you know, it, it's really more just a backdrop and it's a way of kind of looking at a reasoning about like what we should expect from this blockchain phenomenon. So what are we seeing here? This is not like a piece of art. This is actually data visualization. And this is actually a source forge. And that green character is an account called S underscore Nakamoto. So now this is actually check-ins of the Bitcoin uh, source base. Now, what you're going to see shortly is another character is going to join in. And he's actually going to have a non-pseudonymous account which is actually based on like a photo. And that character is actually Gavin Andreessen right here. So he's really kind of the non-pseudonymous nat natural heir to the Bitcoin uh, source, source tree. So the reason why I wanted to kind of like show you this kind of diagram, um, and maybe the audio, the music can come down just a little bit, um, it is, thank you. Uh, so, so uh, the reason why I wanted to show this to you, I I'm just gonna like move to the next slide actually. It's probably easier. Um, yeah, so, so the reason why I wanted to show you this diagram is I think you all are pretty familiar with like open source and you're familiar with the dynamics of open source. But what I wanted to talk about is that what is it that has happened? What has happened is, is that we now have open source financial infrastructure, which is about the transmission of value. So, you know, I promised to talk about sort of a biological metaphor, and I think the metaphor that I want you to use to reason about this phenomenon is, is that the internet has evolved a energy transport molecule, right? So what you have to imagine is in the history of biological evolution, you know, there's a lot of things that relate to the transfer of information. So for example, if you look at DNA and RNA, they're very much useful molecules for transmitting information like biological blueprints. But the blockchain is actually optimized for a different use case, which is really the transfer of energy. And in the particular case that we're describing, it's about the transfer of financial energy. And what you have is, you know, the thing that's, the reason why I think it's a logical fallacy to use the blockchain as an information database is simply because we already have things for that that work beautifully well. So there's like an entire internet that's based on beautiful transmission of information, but what we don't have is we don't have something that natively allows the transfer of value, right? So what emerges from this is this notion of an internet of value. So I think that that's a very important core principle, and I think it's something that we need to understand in the context of the API economy. So this slide actually depicts a little bit of my personal thesis with respect to kind of how I see these assets changing in the broader landscape. And the reason why I kind of look at this is, you know, what I've seen over the past 25 years or so working on open source projects is I've noticed that what Mark Andreessen said is that software is eating the world, right? But what we've, we all know in this room is we know that open source eats software, right? And, and the world is then divided into companies that benefit from open source software and companies that resist or try to compete with open source software. And what we've learned over time is we've learned that the organizations that benefit from open source are the ones that succeed. And why is that? The reason why is very simple. It's that open source essentially 
commoditizes and lowers the cost of infrastructure, right? And what is the natural result of lower cost infrastructure? The natural result of lower cost infrastructure is that it increases and it accelerates innovation on top of that platform, right? The other thing that we can use to reason about open source is we can also look at open source as a novel matrix that competes for consent. One of the astonishing things that's happened is, is if you look inside of a repository like GitHub, what you're going to see is you're going to see this explosion of value. Now, the economy is pretty bad at accounting for the value inside of GitHub. People will actually, the GDP is, if you look at the value of what's inside of GitHub, the GDP will not only say that that's of zero value, but in fact, the GDP will tell you that the, all the software in GitHub actually has a negative value. And the reason it has a negative value is because, you know, my perfectly good proprietary database company is actually decreasing in value as a function of people committing to open source projects, right? Incredibly askew uh, incentive scheme. And yet, what we've seen is a reversal of what we typically see in the internet, which is we see a reversal of what's typically known as the tragedy of the commons. Right, which is you have a commons, you have a center, and the center is actually not only holding, but it's actually flourishing and expanding, which is an astonishing phenomenon. And again, going back to a biological metaphor, like why is it that we're seeing this incredible reversal? Well, I think there's two things to study. One thing to study metaphorically is, is that we've seen a place where a similar reversal of entropy has been seen, and that's the biological diversity in the biosphere. So in the biosphere, we've actually seen a similar uh, creation of order for free and biodiversity. And when you think of it as free, it's actually not free. And so the thing we have to reason about metaphorically is what is causing the biosphere is essentially the energy of the solar input. So the sun has been like doing its job for 4.6 billion years, and that solar input is actually enabled to generate this matrix called the biosphere. So what is the equivalent in open source? I'm going to claim that the equivalent source of energy in open source is consent, which is that the developers consent to build it, the other developers that use it consent to use it, the users consent also to use the products of it. So essentially, the projects that accumulate the most consent generate the most power inside of this matrix. But the thing that's novel about open source is that it isn't just a bubble. And what's been proven when you see all of these big open source software acquisitions like Red Hat and MuleSoft and you know, all these others uh, is, is, and GitHub, is that what's been proven is it's been proven that these things are incredibly accretive of value. And the thing that's fascinating about this accretion of values is all driven by consent. But not only is that happening in its own bubble, but in fact, that bubble actually forces proprietary vendors to compete against this. So what happens is, is it's a matrix that competes for consent, but it also draws proprietary software into that matrix, which is astonishing. So really what it is, is it's forcing proprietary suppliers to compete with open source suppliers. Like that's an astonishing event. So now the order that's been created in the open source matrix is now spreading into the proprietary matrix, which is like amazing and great. The second thing that I think is important is actually that there are really good rules of engagement in open source. And that's the importance, which is that they're structuring. So I was having a conversation with someone about Reddit, and I was like, well, Reddit is pretty much horrible. Like, you know, it's always a race to the bottom, and there's just all these nasty comments and trolls and garbage, right? And so we were discussing that, and what someone said is they said that open source has a very strong, um, uh, basically, peer review process. So when you submit content to open source, Peers are reviewing the content, which is great, right? Pull requests. And the other thing that they said is that it also has almost a citation index, which is that when you look at the package dependency tree, you start to see that the most useful packages are the ones that have the most dependencies out through other projects, right? So that creates this kind of provable hierarchy of supply and demand in this consent matrix. So, so, so these 
in rules of engagement, of course, are the powerful core principles that enable all the energy to flow into open source and form this extremely persuasive matrix. So it's my assertion, just on this slide, depicting this little Pac-Man, that you know, what's happening is, is we now have open source financial infrastructure that will compete for users' consent. And you know, I think at the moment, you know, something like Bitcoin has like two hundred billion dollars worth of consent, and you know, I think people who complain about these packages, I think, may not be reasoning about open source development because a lot of the complaints have to do with bugs that will be fixed. The other thing that people complain about is they complain about Bitcoin as money with a false understanding of what money is. People think money is data, and so what they want is they want an all-singing, all-dancing Bitcoin that can be used as cash, that can be used as credit, that can be used for lending, that can be used, right? That's an incorrect understanding of money. When you look at money from the perspective of money as software, then what you start to think about is you start to think about packages. So if you want to buy a cup of coffee at Starbucks, you're going to buy using a credit card. That's one software package. Debit card's a different package. Gift card's a third package. If you want to buy with cash, that's a fourth package. These are all software packages, and there's no concept of there being one all-singing, all-dancing software package. You'll never find one, right? Like software packages are optimized for their use case, and hence that's what we see here. So if you look at this thesis about so-called open source money, the thing that I think is important to try to understand is, people ask me all the time, they're like, well, it's impossible that Bitcoin will continue to grow and grow in price and value. Like, that, that can't happen. But what I want to assert is that that's probably just an inaccurate picture of what's happening. And a more accurate picture of what's happening is actually that all traditional government-backed currencies are decreasing in buying power over time. So if you're measuring an object with a ruler that's shrinking, then obviously the object you're measuring will appear to be getting larger and larger over time. And this is just a chart that shows that since 1913, the US dollar has dropped in purchasing power by about 95%. So you know, I think that's just a factor of money printing. So you know, the, the point that I wanted to make that's more relevant to this audience, though, is actually completely unrelated to Bitcoin, which is that when we are looking for enterprise use cases for blockchain, I do want to say that we've been in a kind of a dry spell. And the dry spell is, is a bunch of people trying to use blockchain as a database. So this is not fruitful, right? The other thing that's extremely not fruitful is the enterprise trying to use Bitcoin or trying to use Ethereum or trying to use these other things. That's also terribly unfruitful. What I think will be fruitful is the emergence of bank-backed US dollar pegged digital coins. Right. So, an example. So, uh, you know, I'm uh, I'm an investor. One of our investments is a company called Tacit. Tacit is actually a supplier to Signature Bank. Signature Bank in New York is now developed the solution called Signet, and it basically allows their customers to transmit over something that's not Fedwire. So they're now transmitting over blockchain-based payment rails. Now, the thing that's kind of exciting about something like this is, is that enterprises know how to on balance sheet these cryptographic assets, which is that the compliance department says they're dollars, the tax department says they're dollars, the accounting department says they're dollars, the business unit says they're dollars, they're dollars. These are dollars, right? And so the thing that makes it novel, though, is that they're digital dollars. So the thing that's exciting about this kind of a platform is, is you have really instantaneous payments. Like one of the use cases that Paul was talking about with Santander Bank is the notion of, oh, well, you have these invoices and you can actually now sort of maybe securitize the invoice and maybe get some additional payments. Like all of that is just a function of improper transmission of energy, right? The idea of having a payment rail that's instantaneously settled 
actually transforms a lot of potential enterprise API applications. And the day that this becomes feasible is the day that the token or unit of transfer is a dollar, it's backed by a bank, and it's backed by dollar fiat reserves. As soon as you have such an instrument, then the enterprise can actually start developing an API economy that's dollar backed and dollar based. So this becomes really interesting because what you get is you get not out of band API management and payment, you get in band essentially open source and internet protocol based transmission of financial energy. So what you're getting is instead of a web services gateway that kind of counts the method calls, you actually get essentially a permissionless smart contract that meters and vends the value associated with your enterprise. At this point, you actually have a much more composable, open, and dynamic ecosystem where energy is transferred across these different, metaphorically, cells and life forms and organisms, right? So uh, another portfolio company that we invested in is a company called Agoric, and what they're working on are essentially enterprise smart contract technologies. So, you know, there's a lot of people that talk about smart contracts and they talk about like so-called dApps and they talk about all these kinds of things. I think dApps are a bad mindset. I think the thing to reason about with blockchain execution is you should think of them the way that Nick Zabo thinks about them, which is reason about a smart contract as a vending machine, right? So these are vending machines. But the thing that's interesting about looking at a vending machine from the perspective of an API economy is that what you're now able to do is you're now able to see the enterprise as a self-service vending machine. And what happens is, is tokens go in and enterprise services come out, right? This is very interesting and novel. And the thing that I think is exciting about it is, is it creates a new way for enterprises to interact. So for example, one of the use cases for Agoric is in the shipping industry, there are lots of very mom and pop logistics providers. And what happens is, is that when they transfer an asset like a package, as soon as they transfer custody of the asset, they can actually get real-time payment reconciliation, right? So this actually dramatically increases the efficiency of the supply chain network for delivering logistic packages, right? So that's a use case where there's not this kind of crazy enterprise float or invoicing or anything else. And the reason why I think this stuff matters from an enterprise perspective is what's being transferred is not a Bitcoin. It's not Ether. It's a dollar. Dollars are transferred, and they're transferred instantly, which is, I think, pretty novel. So as a closing note, what I want to say is that not only on the enterprise and the banking side are we seeing kind of adoption of open source financial infrastructure, but we're seeing it on the consumer side. And the place where the consumer side is relevant is in the messengers. So I think what's going to happen, everyone has probably heard of Facebook Libra, Right? So that's 2.3 to 2.7 billion monthly active users that will be exposed to these uh, essentially stable payment rails or assets. Another provider is uh, Telegram with about 300 million monthly users. Uh, this, this service actually is going to launch its payment system by the end of uh, October, so actually only in a few weeks' time. Um, Kakao is the dominant messaging service in Korea, which is launching a digital payment for retail consumers, essentially uh, before the end of the year. Another one that will ship before the end of the year is Line, which is the dominant payment, uh, dominant messenger platform in Japan that will launch also a payment token. And then of course, the People's Bank of China is launching a digital payment, blockchain-based digital payment project that will launch with partners Alipay and WeChat, which have an aggregate of 900 million or so daily active users, not just of a messenger, but of a payment system. So one of the things that's happening in the space is we're seeing actually a very large uh, Netscape moment with respect to kind of retail exposure and utilization of this blockchain-based digital payment and cryptographic assets. So. To me, I guess, just to kind of make the final note, um, people who 
are really kind of in the spirit of blockchain but not Bitcoin have been missing, I think, one of the fundamental notions, which is that the killer application of this is payments. But I think what people are doing, that the reasoning incorrectly about payments is they think payments is a vertical application and they think payments is restricted to financial services and so therefore it's not nothing to do with them. But the thing that I think you should reason about is I think you should reason that payments is actually a horizontal application and it's actually an enabling technology for all verticals. Right? And I think what I'd like to suggest is that this slide is very much a retail financial services slide, but that banks near you will start to bring enterprise payments that will be regulated, that will be US dollar pegged, and that will be bank backed with fiat reserves. And I think as soon as they do that, we have the opportunity to now bring the API economy away from out of band billing, monetization, and management to in-band, protocol-based management of transfer of value. So I think that's when this whole thing lights up like a Christmas tree. So I think that that's concludes my talk, so thank you very much.